Hey everyone, welcome back to the Kaderna Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. In today's episode, I'll be speaking with Monica Parker, the founder of Hatch Analytics. Monica uses human analytics to teach clients, including Fortune 500 companies like Google, LinkedIn, Prudential, and many more about how they think, change, and create culture. She's the best-selling author of The Power of Wonder, subtitle The Extraordinary Emotion That Will Change the Way You Live, Learn, and Lead. Prior to founding Hatch, Monica has held various positions, including opera singer, museum exhibition designer, and homicide investigator defending death row inmates for Florida's Department of Justice. It was this last job that sparked her fascination with the little-known human emotion of wonder. So whether you're in the rat race or you're out of the rat race, either way, today's episode, we're going to show you how to find that optimal state, that mindset that can get you the best life possible. Without further ado, here's Monica Parker. Is going to require work and time and sweat and toil. If money wasn't an issue, what would I be doing? Don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. Change the only constant. The Kadena Podcast. Hey, Monica, welcome to the show. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. You know, I go through your bio and it's it's not something I hear about every day. And uh, needless to say, it looks like you covered like a very eclectic mix of career paths. <laughs> yes, I have taken a dog-legged journey to where I am now. It was certainly not a, a linear path. <laughs> it doesn't seem that way. What did you start as? If we kind of go back to the genesis, you know, when you were um, maybe in school or getting out of school, like, where did you see your life going? Well, to be fair, even in school, I couldn't pick just one thing. And I ended up getting a double major and a double minor. And my parents were like, all right, you, you, it's time to leave now. Um, <laughs> so they sort of kicked me out after an extra semester in university because uh, it was it was time. So uh, I ended up my first uh, proper job out of uh, college was as a designer and a designer and an environmental designer. So things like what might be defined by Disney as an Imagineer. So building environments like maybe an inner ear that someone would walk through. And this was for conventions and things. And so I really started in the physical design space. And then doing that, I had, I guess, a bit of crisis of conscious. And I felt like, well, I need to do something that matters. And so I went from that work into um, museum work and then from museum work into death penalty work, which sounds like, how, what's, what's that What's that look like? Um, yep. But I, I thought I wanted to go to law school. And of course, in America, law school usually costs about 100K. Um, mm -hmm. And a friend of mine said, look, if you want to go to law school and help get people off death row, maybe you should really understand what it's all about. So I applied for the position and, um, and passed the tests that they had me do. And, and then I became a homicide investigator. Wow. That, I feel like that's where the big divide was. It sounds like you were a creative, some might say, starting out, and then you take this big jump into uh, to working on death row. And what was that like? I mean, I remember even in, in high school, they took us on a tour of like the uh, the county jail and you got to meet some of the inmates, hear their stories. You know, how did they end up there? Um, everyone kind of had a unique story, but there were common threads. What were some of your findings when you first walked in there? I mean, was it shock and awe or, you know, were these people, was everybody different? Like what was maybe kind of that first impression? It was definitely shock and awe. I will tell you that I was, I feel now being 50, very young. Um, I was uh, about 28 at the time. Um, I was, you know, no other way to put it. I was a privileged white girl whose father was a brain surgeon who went to private school. And now my, I'm tasked with going into communities I had never been exposed to, going into uh, the prison system. And it really blew my mind. It was around the same time that I read the book Nickel and Dime by, by, by Barbara Einrich. And it that was a period of time that just shifted my entire perspective. I had always grown up believing in meritocracy, not believing that there were structural hindrances to anybody's success. <clears throat> and I realized that I was wrong. Um, and doing that work in in the in that field was was just pivotal to my whole life experience and what i found and that's really when i started to discover wonder but i don't think i had the language for it but what i did realize is that people who were 
in prison and certainly on death row, which is basically, you know, a, a super max um, environment where you're you're completely isolated, that these people are in essence entombed and it's a living death. So even though maybe they haven't yet been executed, they are they have a complete devoid a life devoid of any kind of wonder, any kind of, you know, positive stimulus. And I think that that was what started to hit me is how can some of these people who I believed were innocent still manage to be buoyant? And that's what got me into wonder. It's it's so interesting. And it is fascinating when you kind of look at like this subset that's such a small, obviously, segment of the population. And we did one, well, not to, to digress maybe too much on this, but I remember doing a... Um, a program. It was called Lead New Jersey that was throughout our state. It was a bunch of kind of leaders in the, the business and the nonprofit space and the government sector come together. We did a tour of a, a state prison and we actually got to meet a couple of the folks that were on death row. And then afterwards, we had a debate about kind of our, our legal system, at least in New Jersey, where I'm from. And you had like a, a half of our our class that walked away and they were feeling kind of like, you know, sorrow for the inmates and they said you know what they might be innocent and, and then you had the other half like guys these they were convicted of murdering three kids you know and it became this very emotional tense debate that we had of you know were we being manipulated and feeling sorry for these guys or were they just animals that had literally gone out and killed innocent people I mean, what was some of your takeaway there? Did you ever feel some sort of like maybe manipulation or anything from the people you talk to? I I think that's giving some of these guys far too much credit. I mean, a lot of these people are ex-drug addicts. They're, they are mentally disabled. Um, so the idea of ma manipulation, I think, is very rare. There are certainly some of them um, that mm. I wouldn't have wanted to be my next door neighbor. But at the end of the <laughs> day, um, they are human. They are not animals as much as we want to assign them that because then it be is easier for us to deprive them of their life. But the reality is, is that even the families of the those slain frequently don't want this as the as the result. And those that are interviewed after the fact say that that they didn't feel any, they expected to feel some sort of closure and they realized that they didn't, that that's not what closes it. It has to be something that comes internally. But I go back to Alexis de Tocqueville who came from France and looked at our uh, prison systems in the early 1800s. And what he said is that we created, we're creating punitentiaries, not penitentiaries. Penitentiaries of, implies that we want penitence at the end of it. Punitentiaries means that they're built purely for punishment. And I mm -hmm. believe that we can tell the quality of a culture of a nation based on how we treat the quote unquote lowest of that, that uh, population. And certainly mm -hmm. people on death row would be defined as the lowest. And I believe that it says something how we treat those people. And if we treat them as human, then they should have access to things like sunlight, and they should have access to other human beings. And if we think that they're animals, then that is where you and I would have to depart, because I yeah. know that they are very much human. I met their parents, I met their siblings, I'm, in some cases, they're children and they are human. They're human that mm -hmm. did sometimes terrible things. And if you believe yeah. in evil, maybe they're even humans that are evil. But at the end of the day, I don't believe that that means that the state has the right to deprive them of their life because there were innocent people there as well. And we were able yeah. to prove that. So I think as I long think as that's, there's that potential. Yeah, I, th I think that's the saddest thing of all is, is that thought of, you know, what if somebody is behind bars and they are completely innocent? You know, and whether that's a tiny fraction or a large percentage, hopefully it's it's not in the legal system does its job right. But I mean, that's that's almost the saddest thing you could think of is being, uh, you know, uh, improperly accused and locked up. And but, even so if they, they aren't, just to, to add in, because I'm quite passionate about this. If you look at the statistics, um, executions go up in election years. Um, if a black person kills a white person, they are not just exponentially, but logarithmically more likely to be executed. And so there are whole political um, underpinnings to execution. So it's not just about guilt or innocence. I think until we can remove politics from our legal system, um, then yeah. there will always be issues. But anyway, yeah. now I'm yeah. digressing. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, to politics it, finds its way into everything. So, and just to kind of uh, put some context to it. So how did you 
I, I know you wanted to get into law school and someone said, oh, you can go, you know, kind of, I guess, take a tour of sorts of death row. Was that a job or like, were you a social worker or what? Did, how did you even get in there? Yeah, so it is a job. Um, basically, in the state of Florida and a couple of other states, um, in their zeal to execute people as efficiently as possible, they actually have a team of people who do what's known as collateral defense. So after you are convicted of your crime, then there's the period of time of sentencing. Well, a lot of people during sentencing don't actually have their defense counsel. Defense counsel, if it's if it's free, if it's the public defender, goes away during that collateral bit. And reasonably, that is the most important thing if it's between life or death, right? So in that state, because they were taking cases to the Supreme Court saying this person had no defense during the most important part of their case, which is whether they were uh, uh, executed or not, the state said, you're right, we will give them defense. But of course, we were completely underfunded to pack, uh, despite the fact that we our paychecks were signed by the same person who was signing the death uh, notices, which was the governor. Nonetheless, we were we we worked for the same state. And so basically we were a group called Capital Collateral Resource Council um, hmm. or excuse me, Regional Council. And that's what we did. We helped with collateral defense. And so we were actually employees of the state. Interesting. Yeah, I appreciate the background there because I don't I definitely didn't know about this. I think most people would have no idea about it. And so did that lead you into law school or is this when you started to yeah. learn about kind of the, the mentality and the psychology of people? Yeah, it definitely got me interested in psychology. It also made me realize that the death penalty work was not for me. Um, I mm -hmm. gave my boss a commitment of two years. He said people are usually two years or they're lifers. And I learned within a first year that this was not for me, um, I worked very hard, but I think uh, the light that brought me into the work was being extinguished by the just the terrible nature of the world. And so right around that same time was when 9-11 happened. And so I had my own sort of existential crisis. And at that point, I moved from Florida to Cape Cod. Um, and that's where I started uh, a, yet another lifetime. There I, was, I ran a chamber of commerce for uh, several years and also worked with uh, families with children with disabilities. So I, I think it, it informed how I wanted to help people. And it informed that my future employment would be generally helping people through existential change. So really big Got change it. and, and supporting them in that. That's pretty cool. So, I mean, obviously a very diverse background and then that leads up to, you know, hatch analytics and, you know, to, to kind of now fast forward a little bit, what are human analytics? Like, we'll start there. What does that mean when you use that to try and help a company or, you know, management? So the way that we approach it is all of our hatchlings, and that's what we call people who work for Hatch, are master's level social scientists or above. So we're really using social science, psychology, anthropology, sociology, and using data collected through that lens in order to support organizations. So that's what we mean when we talk about human analytics. So it's it's data that is collected through a social science lens, but in a very, um, as scientifically possible, as scientific as we can in a an applied manner. So basically doing almost uh, applied research in the corporate sphere. Okay. And what are some of your findings? Like here we are in 2023, you know, we're just coming off of a, a pandemic that no one has probably ever lived through anything like it before. And yep. now it's, you know, we're doing a Zoom call right now. You're in London. I'm in America and New Jersey. It, it, we're living in this remote world. What are some of your big takeaways that you're seeing in, you know, the corporate world? So the first big takeaway is something I've been talking about for a decade, which is know your business will not fall down if people work remotely. I remember I had one um, uh, CEO, this was about six or seven years ago, who said to me, the human race will end if we don't come into the office because most people meet their mate at work. And if they can't come into the office, then they're not going to meet their mate and procreate. She said this with a straight face. This was her concern <laughs> if people were going to work remotely. I think now we know that the human race will continue to, to move forward while people work remotely. So I think that's the, one of the biggest takeaways. Know your business will not fall down. I think the ever is that work sucks for most people. Most people don't like work. And we're seeing that because of 
COVID, they are now questioning the meaning in their life. They recognize what really matters when you have, again, this is why I focus on existential change. When you have this existential crisis, this thing that could take your life or the life of your, your loved ones, you question what matters in life. And I think a lot of people are saying, I'm not finding meaning in work and I want to. And this is why we're seeing this idea of the great resignation. No, these mm -hmm. people are leaving and then going into completely different fields because I, I believe that most of us were brought up to think you get a job, you work hard, you do well, you buy a house. And now people are saying, wait a minute, is that really what I want? Isn't there more? And so I think people are seeking more and being able yeah. to help people find meaning, help find engagement, and autonomy is really important. And that's, we've been saying that for for a year, you know, years, for a decade at least, but we yeah. see it now manifesting. And to that point, I mean, would you say that that's a, a good thing or a bad thing? Because I think it's good to say, you know, you don't, you don't need to be a slave to your work, you know, go uncover your passion and find what thrills you and chase that. But then I guess on the flip side, if you have everybody kind of do that at once, and then you look at the economy and it's like, well, well guys, you still got to show up and put the work in. Like, where where is that balance between um, just kind of like a utopia and then maybe a, a reality and how you kind of have, find a happy medium? Well, I don't think that it's utopia if someone has work that they find meaning in. I mean, some people want to be the best freaking barista they can be, and that's what they want to do. So I think that there are plenty of people who can follow their passions and it's still work. It's not just they're sitting there, you know, even if they're making floral arrangements, they can still make that work. But the other side of it is some people maybe don't want to find meaning in work. They see work as just a mechanism, but that's fine. The problem is, is when businesses and when leaders of businesses want it both ways, they want to say, I'm going to treat you transactionally, but I want you to treat me like I'm a human. And the reality is some people just want transactional work, but that means that when they do their work, they're done and they want to clock in and clock out. And there becomes this frustration of, oh, it's quiet quitting. No, they just have decided you're treating them transactionally. They will return the favor. So you can't have it both ways. Either you help people find their passion, support that, and give them the autonomy and you know the resources to do that. Or they are a human widget. You treat them transactionally, and they will do the same in return. Got it. And to that point, uh, there's so many different ways we could take this conversation, which I, I like. But if we have, you know, the great resignation happening, um, someone, they they have this awakening from COVID where now they kind of have a bit of that idea of, you know, I've got to, I don't want to say live every day like it's my last, but I, I really want to do what excites me. Mm. And then they find themselves a year or two out, you know, they're no longer working for that company. Maybe now they're running into financial troubles. And they're kind of feeling like, you know, this isn't fair. I'm trying to do what I want, but now I'm I'm stuck. I'm in a pickle. I feel like that's where kind of like reality hits. And it's like, where do you have, I guess, maybe that blend of passion projects slash hobbies and then paying the bills and work and if you can I mean, make it all at, work, that's awesome. But look at Sarah Blakely and Spanx. She worked two jobs for two and a half years before she started Spanx. So I'm not suggesting that people just drop out of you know society. I always mm -hmm. say, if you want to start a business, you have to have at least a year of running capital. When I started Hatch, that's what we did. You know, this was not, we ran this side by side with our day jobs because that was what we knew we needed to do. So there's just good business planning. And some people maybe aren't built to run businesses. I mean, I have a business partner who does all the finance because if I had to do that, I would have tons of work, but the, they'd turn the lights off because they'd go, oh, I forgot to invoice people, you know? So I yeah, think there, yeah. there are practical elements. It's not utopia. It's still it's still work. Um, yeah. But the reality is, is that I think there are a lot of people who understand that and are, are creating an environment where they can be small business owners. But it's not to say you don't have to be your own boss in order to find fulfillment. You know, there are sure. just lots of other types of work that will allow you to do that. And we are in a better position now than ever 
for people to be able to have portfolio lives where they're doing lots of little things that bring them fulfillment and that cobbled together creates an ability to make a living. So I think it's just questioning the assumption that we take a corporate job and that that somehow fuels us for our lifetime and that that is the brass ring. And I think it's just questioning that. And if you question that and the answer is no, actually I like it here and maybe I want to work to change it from within, great. And that's one of the things Hatch does is try to make work suck less for people. I mean, that's really, <laughs> we say better work, better world. We really believe that if work is better, then you go home and you're happier. You have healthier communities and that makes a better world. So we're by no means anti-corporate or anti-work. Uh, it's simply that we know it's not working for so many people. So what can we do to make it work for people? Yep. And so to that point, like when you go into a Google and or a company of that size, are you coaching the executive? Are you co coaching the workers, the employees, and uh, or, or maybe both? And then what are you saying to them? What's like, you know, what's that that point you're trying to drive home to both sides? So what we tend to try to do is be the voice of the employee. So through data collection, we're trying to give a a representation that is is holistic and robust for the executives. Now, what the executives choose to do with that, um, I will be honest, some of them just take it and put it in a drawer. Some are very responsive. Some want to be responsive, but they don't know how. And that's where you do try to coach those that C-suite and to get them to appreciate it. Some are hamstrung by other externalities, whatever that might be. But really, our goal when we go in is to just make sure that in any massive project that is going to affect the people that work there, that you actually get their voice heard on that topic, which sounds like, well, of course, everybody does that. But no, they don't. And if they do it, maybe they do a couple of focus groups. Focus groups are terrible ways to collect data. Um, New Coke is a great example of why focus groups are terrible. Um, and so we really just come in and help them collect data in a responsible way, in a way that we know is scientifically valid, and then help them make decisions based on what we hear. Hmm. And so to kind of sidestep a little bit in a little bit of a different vein, would you say right now, you know, Americans are happy and would you think that that right now, where we are, 2023, that this is the best time to be alive? What's well, those are two your different things. That? So I think it's the best True. time to be alive. But do I think people are happy? No, people are very unhappy. Um, and I think this is actually where we get into wonder. I think being happy is the wrong thing to chase. I don't think that that's realistic. I don't think happiness is sort of a steady state. I think we should seek something like wonder because it is a an emotion that we can have both positive and negative affect together. So wonder has a tinge of sort of the, the joy, but it also has the tinge of the fear. And we can look at the war in Ukraine. We can't be happy looking at that. How can we possibly be happy? But we can be in wonder. And what research shows is that if we're able to hold mixed emotions in our brain, it helps with res re resiliency. It helps us manage trauma. It helps us manage difficult times. And so one of the things is, no, we shouldn't be chasing happiness. We should be tr chasing things like um, psychological richness, which is a lot of variety in our life that that is meaningful. We should be chasing wonder. Um, but no, I don't believe people are happy. But I also, I mean, there's so much research around why we're not happy. Why are we not happy? Because we miswant so many of the things we think will make us happy. It's a psychological term called affective forecasting. We think something will make us happy. We chase it and then we get there. And a few weeks later, it does nothing for us. Why? Because our happiness baseline is set by the time we're about 25. Half of it we're born with and half we build in our personality by the time we're about 25. And that's our baseline. And we can buy all the Louboutins and you know the nice whiskey or whatever it is, but we will always come back to that hedonic baseline. And that's what's known as the hedonic treadmill. So that's the kind of consumerist nature of America that we're always driving to get more, more, more. Um, the additional part is that even eudaimonic happiness, which is sort of this well-being element, still is not does not offer the quantum of benefits of something like psychological richness or wonder. Hmm. So I like could going back to our forefathers that said, you know, in in you know, we have a pursuit of happiness. You know, that was one of the, the tenets of Americana. Would you replace happiness in that sense with wonder that people should be pursuing kind of what yeah, excites them or things? 
Yeah. I would. Yeah, I, I would. Things that, that make them feel because wonder is has the potential to be a a, a self-transcendent emotion. It really it it quiets the ego. It makes us better people. It makes us better community members. We're more tolerant. We're more humble. We're more generous. Like these are all qualities that that we want in 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 a nation, you know, if we're to talk about America. Um, and I think it's something that we're, we're really missing. I also believe that we have created discourse that is so polarized. Um, and the problem is, is that we're becoming more and more entrenched in those two poles. And the benefit, again, of mixed emotions, it's bringing together the two poles of our emotional polarity together so that we can challenge in our own brains what what side we want to end up on and in that gray in that nuance by embracing a little bit of that discomfort we find tolerance and i think one of the challenges is we become so polarized that we're not even looking for nuance anymore and that is something that an emotion like wonder or nostalgia or gratitude um or what's known as existential longing or bittersweet susan kane wrote a book, great book about that so these mixed emotions allow us to draw in the poles and i think that that is is really important for us as humanity frankly so how do you get somebody kind of thinking about this like let's say you go into one of these companies you're brought in as a consultant you meet with some of the staff a good company but they're feeling unfulfilled Mm -hmm. And so you tell them, you know, you want to have a pursuit of wonder. Where do they begin? Is it just, do they kind of do some survey on, on their own personality or get them thinking? Like, where do you, where does that first five minutes start? Yeah, we, you know, we have trainings on wonder at work that can be as short as a half day to just a, sort of a primer to get people excited about the idea that it can be extended as uh, large as, you know, six different modules. But we look at the components of what wonder at work can create. So we're looking at things like empathy, humility, authenticity, inclusivity, uh, um, psychological safety. So these are the different modules that we'll go through. And I think that when you break it down, I, I respect that if I were to ask you to go into your boss and say, we need more wonder at work, you might get a bit of side eye. Like I understand <laughs> that, but you know, you would have gotten that 10 years ago before Brene Brown talked about vulnerability, but now we all accept that vulnerability is what we want. Um, we would have talked about EQ uh, before Daniel Goleman wrote his book that it was wild. You know, well, what are you talking about? IQ is certainly the most important thing. So I think that we recognize now that soft skills, that these social skills, and I hate the term soft skills because it implies that somehow it's mealy, but it's not, that these social skills are core capabilities that businesses require. And so this is just another way of breaking down those core skills and then aggregating them in a way that I think is really usable um, and effective as opposed to, you know, having them all broken up. I don't think people would disagree that training on empathy is helpful, that training on humility, you know, to be a more humble boss, the research is really clear. You have better communication in your teams. You empower people mm -hmm. in a more effective way. You know, obviously the psychological safety data, Google has given us that. That's very clear. So I think it's really just about coming in and convincing people that this is not so far out it's actually aligned with probably what you want your leadership dna to be and maybe that's the first step is just saying what is your current leadership dna what is it that you incentivize your leaders to be and if it's just about bottom line re uh, results then we have a problem and so looking at that because i can train you know, 100 people at the base of an organization, but if they are not incentivized through the system, through the structure to behave that way, then it's just a waste. So it really starts with what is the leadership DNA? Do we want to restructure that? And I'm doing that with a company right now. And we've restructured mm -hmm. their leadership DNA to include some of these um, different capacities and these capabilities. And now then we can look at training. And so one of the things you talk about in your new book, you, you say that you know, you have commentary on daydreaming. Um, I know one of the things you say is let yourself be bored. So is that something that, um, you know, people should be kind of practicing some of these exercises on their own? Or do you bring that into the corporate world? I mean, I could just imagine going up to to some high powered executive saying, oh, you know, let your employees daydream. It's okay if they're bored. And he'd be like, are you kidding? Like, we've, we've got a, a bottom line that we've got to meet to keep everybody happy. Um, 
So where, in what context do you bring in that, that kind of daydreaming, wondering, shutting off kind of exercise? I mean, we, we see it already, but we have to label it something really sexy. So like a hackathon, right? We have hackathons mm-hmm. to come up with solutions, but really what that's just, a, it's a structured daydream. It's basically a structured way of of eliciting a different type of thinking. So really it's about creating the space for decision-making. I mean, we can look at um, Daniel Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, right? So yeah. he he explains very clearly that if there's time to slow down, that's usually the right thing to do. But in turn, we reward um, leaders who make decisive, fast decisions, even if it's proven later that that decision was the wrong decision. And so we have a, a culture that drives people towards action, action, action. It's called action bias. And it's, it's, I think to organizations detriment. So we really do need to slow down and yes, allow people to be bored because that's where some of those ideas come up with. I mean, think about, you know, uh, Eureka, I found it. That was, you know, he was in the bathtub when he said that, at least that's the urban myth, right? Um, But the reality is, is if we don't allow thinking time, then how can we solve the real true thorny problems? And so, yes, I would like people to allow more time. I think one of the industries that's the worst about this is the legal industry that is ripe for disruption. And yet they have a coding, a an hourly coding for their hourly coding, right? They have to do everything in, in some places, even seven and a half minute increments. And as they bill, then they even have a billing code to do their billing codes. And that to me is just this <laughs> <It's> circular <crazy. laughs> insanity um, yeah. because it, it's there's no time for the thinking. And I, I think that that I know that that is to the detriment yeah. of innovation, of engagement um, and certainly of wonder. And I wanted to ask you that, uh, and I'm glad you brought up. So we have kind of on maybe the negative side or the side that's not doing it right now, the legal industry, where is it being done right? Do you have a model where you could say, look at what those guys are doing? Is it like a Facebook with the hackathon where they, you know, who, who's really maybe on the cutting edge of some of this innovation? I, I know people want to think that tech is there. Um, I think that Google, when they had this, they had an idea that, you know, Fridays would be one day a week would be, you know, just you time and you could come up with different initiatives and the like. The reality is that, you know, some of these big corporates are just cult of personality factories. And at the end of the day, I don't know that they actually allow for that um, for that new thinking to happen. But at least what they do get right is they have environments that facilitate that for the most part. So they have environments that have lots of light that are inspiring, that have big environments that make you feel like a smaller component part um, of a bigger system. I think they they do a better job of bringing together different types of thinkers and then breaking them apart again. I think they could do even better at that. Um, and so I would say that technology Technology firms are probably on the better side of the spectrum, but I would not say by any means that they've cracked it because I, there is still a, if the best culture can be destroyed if people are overworked. And so if you come in and say, I want to create an environment that encourages this, you know, for ideas to flourish, but people are just burnt out, then it doesn't matter. And so I think that that is something they still have to come to terms with. Hmm. And so one of the things I I talk about, um, and and I've talked about this a lot in my first book, and then I kind of reiterate it in What Should I Do With My Money, the book that just came out recently. I like to highlight what I call the three eyes that I think, and this is just my take, that a fulfilled career has the three eyes, income, independence, and impact. And if you can kind of find how to to capture all three in whatever your job is or your endeavor, then you're going to be happy. Um, what's your take on that? Because it is hard to do, obviously. And and it, there's times throughout your career in your life where you might have one but not the other. Um, do you have any comments you would say on that, on, on those I, three I eyes? absolutely agree, because that's that's sort of another take of of Dan Pink's drive. Um, around, you know, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So when you're Mm -hmm. talking about impact, that's the purpose, the independence, that's autonomy, income, that's just, uh, you know, what allows people to exist. 
And I make the point, you know, I try to always make the point that there is there is privilege inherent in even talking about finding your bliss or quitting your job. You know, that's not that's that that's not an option for a lot of people or even moving jobs. And so I recognize that in that that there is a there's a realism factor. But absolutely, I I have been preaching that meaning and autonomy are critical. And even if you have a highly meaningful job, if you don't have the autonomy to do what you know you're capable of, then that becomes a sticking point and that becomes stressful. So I think that those three make a lot of sense. And I would throw in uh, the, which perhaps is sort of a mixture of the impact. I guess you can't have the impact if you're not good at it, but doing something that you're really good at. So you can achieve absorption, you can achieve flow such in such a way that that feeds you and that can almost become self-transcendent as well okay and do you believe in goal setting or are you more of a uh kind of just i don't want to say fly by the seat of your pants but like see what the day brings you kind of follow your flow what do you think about that i i'm tear i it's physician heal myself i'm terrible at doing all the things that i tell other people to do but i will tell you that i know the data supports goal setting. And there's a lot of talk about manifesting things and the secret. At the end of the day, that is just a priming in action. There's a reason that when people set goals and they write them down and they rehearse them, then they're more likely to achieve them because your brain sets more cognitive energy towards achieving that. I mean, that's what it comes down to. And so if we set a goal and we're very clear about it, we write it down, we read it frequently, you're just basically priming yourself every day. And there's great research, you know, wonder research about this. Uh, they, the researchers took two groups of people, asked them to take a walk. One of them was just take a walk in nature for 20 minutes. The other was take a walk in nature for 20 minutes but they were primed with a one sentence prime, which said, you will find things to feel wonder about on that trip, on that on that walk. The people who took the regular walk came back and reported some benefits, but they had gotten caught ruminating about other things. The people who took the wonder walk came back, had bigger smiles in their selfies, had better stress reduction for the following week. And that's just a simple one line prime. So our brains are like little, you know, bloodhounds, go fetch. So if you tell it, this is something we want to achieve, then it will look to achieve that. So I do believe in goal setting. And I know that at least from the science, it does make a difference. Yeah, and I would agree. I'm I'm a very goal-oriented person. I think that's key. And maybe to kind of tie all of this together, because a lot of this kind of pursuing what you're passionate about and chasing this wonder, like it, I think some people are going to, listeners are going to say, well, that all sounds good and well, but we keep kind of like coming back to the real world of sorts. And what I say to that point, like, I love my job. I love where I'm at. You know, I have a big financial advising practice. Now I get to write books, do this podcast and such. But the first three to five years of trying to build my business, it just absolutely sucked. There's there's yeah. a, almost no way around it. There were some fun points, the folks I got to work with, clients I met and stuff. But by and large, a lot of it, the studying, the the very long hours, the rejection. But every why day did you it do like, it? But because why did I you had, stick with it? Because there was th this vision, and it, it is almost a leap of faith of someday I can get to what I was told about when I interviewed back in college that this can be a career unlike any other. And, and I just clung to that. And that's the thing. That's why I say it's not about happiness. You weren't happy all the time during that because it it did suck. It was really, really hard. But you can be in wonder at what you hope to achieve. What you were discussing is this epistemic curiosity. So this real, true, deep curiosity of learning in order to fulfill yourself or your future desires. You had that goal at the end. And so this is where I want to encourage people that it's not about happiness. It's about that level of personal fulfillment that you get mm -hmm. when you have those goals, when you can achieve them, when you do them with other people, when you are learning for the sake of learning. But I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, no, that was uh, that kind of I think it was in agreement with uh, and kind of underscored some of my mindset at that time, because a lot of people were telling me like, what are you doing? Just go get a job. Go get a nine to five job. You won't have to stress about this bill and that and the other. And I was like, no, you don't get it. Like there's there's something here that I'm I'm gonna get towards. And then when it came to fruition, it's like how quickly everybody forgets like that life was really, really tough there for much of your 20s. 
um they're just like oh man you got a you got a great job you got it made what do you worry about and it's like this didn't just happen you know mm. and so when like i don't know if you deal with you know college students at all interns young professionals um i think a lot of them are confused and i think there's a lot of mixed messages especially in academia that you can get where it's like you it's you're taking in so much stuff that you are wondering about. That's so exciting. And, and then you're mm. ready to go make your mark on the world. And then you step out of college and you're the grunt and, and yeah. you're in the mail room or whatever. How do you maybe kind of help them through that period or help them find like what their path should be? Cause I, I personally, I know so many people that not only struggle in college, but through their twenties and beyond just saying like, I don't really know what I should do. So I am living this because my niece, who is uh, just one of my favorite people, is graduating this May from Emory, and she is going nice. through this process right now. And I am talking to her about it, and she sees some of her friends who are so clear on what they're going to do. And I said, none of that means anything. You know, your life does not is not linear. This first job that you take is that's all it is. It's a first job. It's not a stake in the ground that says, this is who I'm going to be forever. It is an opportunity to learn about yourself. And that's one of the things that I, you know, coming back to wonder, I talk about this idea you said that you can see there is more, there's something beyond yourself that you wanted to create. And I believe that sometimes we are too focused on what we can see in our own sphere and we're not focused on the more and having faith that there is more. And so what I tell kids who are graduating is take a job that treats you fairly, that pays you fairly, and then just learn what you like and what you don't like about it. And then just keep building that picture of what the ideal is. You're only 22. You still have three years before your brain is even set. So allow yourself that time to learn what it is you want. And I think even more importantly, what you don't want. So that's great. Have a job that sucks for a couple of years and go, oh my goodness, that was terrible. You'll never do it again, you know, avoid it. So I think that this is the opportunity to, um, to do that. Kids graduating from high school today, and this is a number, I've been quoting this um, statistic for years and it keeps changing. It is now a kid today graduating from high school have 18 jobs in six industries. So this idea of a job for life wow. is gone. It used to be, it was five and 16 jobs in five industries. It's now gone to 18 jobs in six industries. This, this, is a, this is a process. It's not just a destination. It is a journey. It is a journey that may have, you know, circular routes and backtracking and just try to enjoy the ride and learn as much about yourself in the process. Don't give yourself grace and don't feel like you're somehow having to put your stake a claim to what you're going to be, you know, when you're 80. I like it. So I have a two part question for you, kind of in that same thought. When I did a lot of my research on education, when I, I wrote my book, I was comparing America and China and, and mm. you know, the two superpowers in the modern era and how we educate. America is very much some of what you're saying, kind of find what you love, find what you do, go make mistakes, fail fast, figure out what you're going to be good at. China, you know, obviously a communist nation, much more structured. They're seeing what does our country need right now? And then they're essentially assigning the students to go pursue this track. They don't, unless you're uh, the valve Victorian or just a real superstar where they'll say, okay, you can pick your major by and large, they're kind of set on a track that this is what the country needs, whether it's STEM or whatever. And this is what you're going to study where America is, you know, free, you know, go find what's good for you. What's your take on that? And second part of that question is, you know, do you believe in college as we live through the student loan epidemic? What role does college play? So I know that's a lot, but if okay, you can kind no, of speak I, So to I'll start by saying that my nieces are uh, interracial. They are Chinese and American. So um, uh, my sister-in-law was born and raised in China and moved here 30 years ago um, with my brother. And so I, I do understand, I think, that system intimately. I think it's really difficult for us to compare because the reality is, is we're dealing with two entirely different cultures, not just of of schooling, but of just the way that they view the world. And I think if we think of not just genetics, but epigenetics, the kind of stuff that gets handed down generationally, you're talking about two entire, yes, they're humans, we're humans, but we are two entirely different mindsets of human beings. And so 
what might work for within the Chinese school system doesn't necessarily work here. You see the idea of the tiger mom and people bristle against that. What I will say is my belief that wonder has been removed from schooling. And I believe that that is, um, that's been removed from the U S and I can't speak intimately about China, but to a large degree, I believe there as well. And I think that's to everyone's detriment. Uh, we know that wonder in learning helps embed things in long-term memory. So I believe that it, any kind of schooling that is so hyper-focused on on um, standardized tests is not helpful. I don't think that it helps kids learn how to learn. They're just learning to know the single right answer. And what you end up with when you teach kids the single right answer, whether it's in China or in the US, they come out and they decide there's always one answer to every question. So again, there's no nuance, there's no gray. That's where we get these polarized ideas again. Um, so I would say that, that China, perhaps what they're doing works for them, but you can't compare the two um, mm -hmm. without recognizing that the cultures are entirely different, um, almost from a genetic and epigenetic point of view. Now, if we talk about college, I believe that um, the college probably can't. What college taught me more than anything was how to be a grown up, but with uh, you know, the little, uh, the, the bouncers, the, the, the protective, the protective layer on either side, you know, the bumpers. Um, I think that you can find that in other ways. What I would be concerned about people missing out on college is if they are not in an environment where they have that degree of socialization, because we know that in our late teens, early twenties is when we make friends that we frequently have for a lifetime. Once we start to move, it becomes much harder for us to make friends. It's all about proximity. So I think that college can go by the wayside, but we want to make sure we're creating communities where these young people can come together so that they're able to develop those lifetime friendships that happen. And we see that in like people who are in the army. Um, we see it in some, you know, cultures where kids go to kibbutz and then come back. So it needs to be some kind of environment where they're really thrown together and there's a sense of community created. And maybe some of these big tech companies do it. You know, maybe if you're the first, you know, if you're a cohort in, say, Google, you create that relationship. But um, I don't believe that college is the answer. And I think we should be going back to looking at things like internships and um, and more practical application of skills. But I don't want kids to miss out on the, the socialization that occurs in those environments. Yeah, I think we are kind of like minded on that, that, uh, you know, that. And the reason that I say that, I mean, I think right now, I think there's a bit of a correction going on with college and you're seeing it. Everybody's starting to question the diploma, the bill and everything. And that I get interviewed a lot on like the the loan forgiveness and the different economic consequences of it all. And that was kind of my stake. And sometimes I say, you know, I'm, I'm against the loan forgiveness. And, you know, a lot of young people are like, well, what are you talking about? Why can't we get our loans forgiven? But I feel like that that can in a way perpetuate, you know, the existing structure where if we don't have that, that's going to just encourage people more to question, is it valuable? Should I take on that big debt? or whatever, you know, is it going to give me the reward that I'm hoping for? The problem is until the structures that hire people say it doesn't matter anymore, then it has to matter. And that's the unfortunate thing. So I Hatch also does a lot of work in EDI. and i And one of the things that we're yep. trying to get them to do is say college degree is not the entrance exam. Oh, into drives me nuts. Or, yeah. And so I think yep. places are starting to do that. I'm working with a large recruiting firm that's trying to then recruit people that they place into organizations and say, look, this person doesn't have a college degree and they're now your star employee to get those big corporates <laughs> to change. So I think until we can change that, while we might have this opinion, if people still want to go into these these fields where that is the entrance, basically, the, the, the ticket to entry, um, then then we're doing them a disservice to say, oh, go and try something else. But it is my yeah. my belief and desire that that should change. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. Nothing drives me crazier than, again, seeing, you know, four year degree required. And it's like, why? <laughs> that doesn't necessarily apply to that space. 
Um, so we'll there's we'll see how that unfolds. Yes, yeah, there's a great piece of work um, ab- around um, what's known as skills clustering. They started in Australia, and this idea that you teach rather than teaching to particular a particular degree, you teach to a skills cluster. So you might teach to say communication cluster. And what they found is rather than having people take a specific degree, and I understand like accounting, you have to be certified, and so that's a degree or legal. But you say you t- take communication, it, it allows you to apply for so many other jobs. So if you were to say, you know, get qualifications in a communication cluster, you could do everything from working at marketing, advertising, a teacher, um, you know, podcast or anything that involves communication. There's a technologist, there's different skills clusters. And I think it's a very interesting way of looking. I can send you that and maybe you can share with your listeners, sure. but I think it's really a fascinating different way of approaching rather than just this very narrow idea of what a degree means. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's definitely something that needs to be continued to be debated and, uh, hopefully everything kind of finds that homeostasis there. So in closing, I I always like to do a bit of a lightning round with my guests. I know our listeners love it where we get to know a little bit more about you. Uh, so if I can just fire some questions at you, first thing that comes to mind and we'll have a little fun with it. So what is your favorite book? My favorite book is we'll say Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. I already mentioned, I mentioned Nickel and Dimed. So uh, I'll go with Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. Got it. And a favorite movie? Favorite movie. Uh, I won't go erudite for this one. I'm going to go for Top Gun, the first one, because goodness, I I watched that VHS tape till it wore out when I was a teenager. (laughs) And do you have a quote that you live by? Um, I do. Uh, it's uh, what uh, we, where the name for Hatch came from. It says you cannot go on uh, indefinitely being an ordinary, decent egg. We must be hatched or go bad. And that's C.S. Lewis. So I think that's a clarion call for change. Very cool. And do you have a morning routine? And if so, what is it? What's that first thing you do? Oh, my morning routine. I don't like mornings. I'm a vampire. And so my morning routine is that my husband very gingerly offers me my cup of tea um, in the morning. And then I will slowly start to uh, check my emails. But unfortunately, I'm not a morning person at all. And I wish I told you that I worked (laughs) out and I meditated and all these things. No, I don't do any of the things that are good for people. (laughs) Fair enough. And uh, you've traveled a lot, had a very eclectic career. Do you have a favorite vacation or destination? I think the place that resonates most with me that is my happy place is a place that I'm lucky to have a home in, and that is the south of France. I love that area of the Mediterranean. I find the people and the cuisine and all of it is just suits me perfectly. It's the style of life that I love. That's awesome. And last but not least, did you have a hero growing up? And if so, who was it? Did I have a hero growing up? I mean, it sounds cheesy, but probably at the time when I was a kid, it would have been my mom. That's great. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Monica. I know we covered a lot of ground here, but uh, so many takeaways, and I think a lot of them practical that that our listeners can take advantage of. Thank you for your time. I, I really enjoyed it, Brian. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, everyone, thank you again for tuning into the Kaderna podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. Please make sure to leave a review wherever it is that you're listening or watching, and we will see you next time. This podcast is intended for the general public and for informational purposes only. The show does not provide any recommendations or investment advice regarding any specific account type, service, strategy, or product, or to otherwise act in any fiduciary or other capacity. Please contact a financial professional for guidance and information that is specific to your situation. Brian Kaderna does not provide tax or legal advice. Please contact your accountant or legal advisor to discuss your situation. Guest speakers and their firms are not affiliated with or endorsed by Park Avenue Securities, Guardian, or Kaderna Financial Team, and opinions stated are their own. All investments contain risk and may lose value. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. References to specific securities, asset classes, and financial markets are for illustrative purposes only and do not constitute a solicitation, offer, or recommendation to purchase or sell a security. Brian Kaderna is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, OSJ, 300 Broadacres Drive, Suite 175, Bloomfield, New Jersey, 07003, phone number 973-244-4420.
Securities products and advisory services offered through PAS, member FINRA, SIPC. Financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. Hiderna Financial Team is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. California Insurance License Number 0K04194.